Welcome to 35 West. I'm Ryan Berg, director of the Americas program at CSIS and host of the 35 West podcast. With how professional the Mexican but government are we ready? I don't think. Reform trends in Argentina. Right. And that's what happened. No role at all in the NAFTA negotiation. Welcome to 35 West. I'm Ryan Berg, director of the Americas program at CSIS and the co-host of the 35 West podcast. Few issues better capture modern technological competition between the United States and China than semiconductors. Often referred to as chips, semiconductors form the building blocks of modern digital life. Chips govern everything from missile guidance systems to the headlights in your car. And the fight for the cutting edge of this technology appears to be entering a new phase. The United States, in partnership with allies like Japan and the Netherlands, has sought to cut off China's access to advanced chip designs and semiconductor manufacturing equipment. In response, China has announced a raft of export controls on minerals needed to produce modern chips, leveraging its dominance in the supply chain for mining and refining key materials. These actions reinforce the importance of finding alternative sources and de-risking the critical mineral supply chain, a complex challenge and one which will demand closer cooperation between the United States and mineral-rich countries especially those in the Western Hemisphere. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Dr. Chris Miller, Associate Professor with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and author of one of the best reads on semiconductors and great power competition, Chip War, the Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. In this episode, we will explore the challenges, choke points, and opportunities facing the United States and allies as they race to secure semiconductor mineral supply chains. Thank you for joining us today on the podcast, Chris. Thank you for having me. Chris, I've tried to give a broad overview of the competition that's heating up in the semiconductor space, but as the person who quite literally wrote the book on this subject, I'm hoping you can sketch for our audience a brief scene setter. Could you share a brief overview of what key actions the United States has taken to restrict China's access to chips, and what have China's responses been to date? The U.S. strategy is to try to limit China's access to the most high-end chips, the types of chips that are used for training and deploying artificial intelligence systems. For example, these chips are almost exclusively designed by U.S. firms, and they're largely manufactured in Taiwan, but they draw on a supply chain that stretches around the world from Europe to Japan to Korea. And so U.S. export controls prevent not only the transfer of these chips, but also the transfer of the high-end tools that are used to make these types of chips to China. And China's responded in a number of ways. I think first to note is actually that China's been driving towards a more self-sufficient chip industry now for well over a decade, and it's been spending tens of billions of dollars a year I like to think of it as one CHIPS Act per year for most of the last decade. And so in some ways, China's actually less responding to the U.S. than the U.S. is responding to China's efforts to subsidize its own chip industry. But China has directly responded to the more recent U.S. controls, both by punishing Western companies, preventing companies in the United States from selling into China's market, but also by threatening and imposing new licensing regimes on access to some critical materials, the most notable gallium and germanium, which today are largely processed and refined in China. Chris, the semiconductor supply chain is really renowned for its complexity, with dozens of highly specialized firms providing the inputs ultimately required to produce a finished chip. Just because a country is responsible for a preponderance of a certain mineral does not necessarily mean it represents a choke point in the supply chain, especially if substitutes are available or alternative suppliers can be brought online quickly. What, in your opinion, is needed for us to determine that a particular mineral is acting as a choke point in the semiconductor supply chain? Well, I think the key in the industry, as you say, is that it's not just the mining, it's also the refining and the processing. The good news is that a lot of the ultra high end refining actually happens in Western countries right now. Japan, for example, is one of the key players in the refining of minerals to the extraordinary degree of purity that's required for chip making. But if you go earlier in the supply chain, what you do find is that a number of countries that are probably not reliable suppliers, but China, most importantly, do play a big role. But I I think to really understand where we face challenges and where we don't face challenges, we need to ask a number of other questions. It's not just what share of production or initial processing 
happens in China, but it's also what's the scope for reducing use of these materials if we need to. In some cases, you, you really can't reduce scope without paying a big penalty. But in other cases, there are recycling mechanisms, for example, and some of the gases and chemicals that are used in shipmaking where you actually can make a lot of progress in reducing your reliance. The second question is, if you were to lose access to the supply of minerals from China or elsewhere, how quickly and easily could you bring online supply in a new location? And again, this varies dramatically by type of mineral, but it's a key question to ask when thinking about how dependent are you really. It seems that many companies and countries are only now coming to the realization of the fragile state of the semiconductor supply chain. What is the state of U.S. efforts to map critical mineral supply chains for semiconductors in particular? Well, I think this has been an area of increasing focus the past couple of years. But I also think that it's an area where more work needs to be done. We had a bit of a shock in 2022 when during the early stages of the Russia-Ukraine war, Russia banned exports of neon gas, which is one of the gases used in shipmaking. And it simultaneously knocked offline one of the other major producers, which was Ukraine. And the chip industry had a brief moment of really severe concern when it was unclear whether there would be alternative suppliers that would come online rapidly enough. And in the event they did, and neon gas prices increased, but it wasn't enough to cause any sort of production problems. But I think that illustrates the extent to which there are a fair number of minerals, chemicals, gases that we haven't really done enough stress testing of how our supply and demand needs would shift amid a crisis. And I think right now you see both companies and governments trying to undertake that process and exploring what their alliances are and where they'd like to have a more diverse set of potential suppliers. We've seen China's willingness to wield its influence over critical minerals as a weapon, with the PRC establishing export controls, as you mentioned, Chris, for gallium, germanium, and graphite, among others. As competition between the U.S. and China increases, how likely do you think we are to see China continue to target mineral supply chains? Well, I'd say this has been proven to be an area of focus of Chinese policymakers over the past now over a decade since the first restrictions were placed on rare earth exports amid the dispute between China and Japan in the 2011 time frame. This is a policy tool that Chinese leaders have repeatedly turned to. And the fact that they did so again last year in the case of gallium and germanium shows that it's certainly on their radar screen in terms of retaliatory mechanisms. I think the challenge that China faces is that right now, preventing the access of critical minerals is a blunt tool. China knows it can create a lot of disruption to Western supply chains, U.S. producers, but it also, in doing so, would probably end up hurting Chinese producers as well because the supply chains are so complex that some of the disruption would boomerang back into China. That doesn't mean that they're not going to keep using these tools, but it does mean that they face real costs for doing so. And that's the good news. I think the bad news is that Chinese leaders are right to note that for now, for a lot of these minerals and materials, China does play a really dramatic and in some cases an essentially monopolistic role. And I think if only for reasons of market competition, there's plenty of rationale for Western leaders to push against that and try to bring some additional sources of supply online. The complexity of modern chips means that increasing resiliency and redundancy in their manufacturing process is no easy feat. On mineral inputs specifically, Chris, we've heard that it can take years for a new supplier to be vetted for use by semiconductor fabs, meaning that even countries with significant reserves of critical minerals may not be able to seamlessly integrate into the supply chain, at least not in any time frame, that provides us with certainty. Is there a role for the United States in encouraging a smoother process to bring in alternative suppliers? I certainly think there is. And I think the question of can you qualify new suppliers is something that you've got to do before a crisis emerges because you don't want that to be the issue that prevents alternatives amid a crisis. It's one thing to say we can't access enough of a given material, but it would be even worse to say we actually could access it. We're just not comfortable. It meets all of the specifications. To me, that is exactly where the effort should be focused right now is if we know we have alternative sources of supply that are economically viable, cost competitive or close enough to cost competitive with China, getting contracts signed now, getting materials qualified, getting relationships established is, I think, critical to making sure that if there is a disruption in the future, we've already smoothed out some of the potential difficulties that would arise if we needed to rapidly shift.
At the cutting edge of semiconductor manufacturing, the ever-evolving landscape makes it hard to predict which materials will be needed for the next evolution of semiconductors. This requires a balance between building resiliency with current materials and planning for resiliency regarding future materials. How can the United States and allies in the Western Hemisphere improve supply chain security in light of the difficult balance stemming from this uncertain context? Well, it certainly is uncertain which share of materials will be needed in next generation ships. I think the good news for planning purposes is that even when we bring online production of next generation ships, we still end up producing a large number of prior generation ships. And so we produce more and more chips every year, some of which are cutting edge, but many of which are chips that were pioneered years or in some cases decades ago. And so we still need the materials for all of those as well. And so if you look at the aggregate base of minerals going into chip manufacturing, I think you find that it changes less slowly than the pace of technological advance might suggest, because those less advanced ships are just as important as the most advanced ships. In some ways, they're even more important because our entire manufacturing base depends on them. And so when I think of supply needs in 10 or 15 years time, I think it's right to ask what are the new materials we're going to be using. But if you just looked at today's materials, you'd have a pretty good rough sense of a big portion of demand because we're going to still be producing most of the types of chips we produce today in 10 or 15 years time. While there is great enthusiasm for developing components of the semiconductor supply chain on part of Western Hemisphere countries, much of this has been focused on assembly, testing, and packaging, or even the construction of fabs themselves. How can the United States encourage more investment in mining and processing as part of the parcel of shoring up semiconductor supply chains? Can instruments like the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund or the ITSE Fund or the Inflation Reduction Act play a part in this effort? Well, I think part of the challenge of quote unquote competing with Chinese mining and then processing refining firms is that in a lot of cases, you're not actually competing in a market. You're competing against essentially the Chinese state. And that's especially true in the more niche materials where there is a less liquid market. And so Chinese domestic regulations often determine what prices are. You see this, for example, in the rare earths market, because China is the world's largest producer and even more importantly, the world's largest refiner and processor of rare earths materials. Whatever the Chinese government dictates has a dramatic effect on the price. And so foreign companies find that when they want to bring online production, that the Chinese government will try to reduce prices just as they're bringing production online, make their businesses unprofitable, their investors will complain. And because unlike Chinese firms, they're actually profit-oriented, that really calls into question their business model. And so I think governments do have a role to play here, both because we need resilient supply chains that aren't totally reliant on China, and because actually it's not a market if there's just one player and the player is China. And so I think simple antitrust concerns should make us skeptical of the status quo where it's just China or Chinese state-owned companies that dominate these markets. And I think governments can do a couple of things. I think one is matching suppliers with customers in the West uh, is a role that governments can help to play. Obviously, these relationships have to have commercial logic to them. But I think we do see an increasing role of for commercial diplomacy and helping mining companies understand who their off takers might potentially be and establishing those relationships. And then I think second, de-risking on the financing side is also critical because mining investments are both capital intensive and have a very long payback period. And I think what we found over the last couple of years, if not decades, is that we've underinvested mining in friendly countries because China, Russia, and others have been able to deploy capital at lower interest rates over longer time horizons. And you know that's not the market at work. That's adversarial governments at work that are deploying capital in ways that are generally inimical to our interests. And certainly we would categorize Western Hemisphere countries as friendly countries, at least for purposes of trying to nearshore some of that mining activity. The minerals used in semiconductor manufacturing often require significant processing and refining before they can be used. Semiconductor grade silicon, for example, requires a purity of 99.9999% or higher. In addition to mining more within the Western Hemisphere, how can the United States promote more advanced processing and refining in the region? The challenge with the processing and refining step for semiconductors is at least when you get to the highest end of the processing and refining spectrum is that the precision required, the purity required is so high that you really do end up with situations in which customers are hesitant to take risks. 
because having a product that is insufficiently pure can cause a vast disruption to your manufacturing operations if you've got some of the wrong material present in your chip making capabilities. And so what we found in the industry is that there's actually been increasing concentration among mineral suppliers who are capable of convincing their customers that they can provide reliable, highly pure supply. And I think what this speaks to is the likelihood that if you want high-end purification and refining, you've got to do it in partnership with industry leaders. And industry leaders are in the U.S., but they're also in Japan and Europe. And they, they need supply for the minerals in question, but they often have the expertise to bring the refining up to the just extraordinarily precise level that chip making generally necessitates. Dr. Chris Miller, Associate Professor with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and author of Chip War. Thanks for joining us on 35 West. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. For you, thank you for joining. Stay tuned for the next episode of 35 West.